Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you are having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. My family has lived in this historic neighborhood for over a century. The beautiful Victorian homes lining the streets represent a simpler time when craftsmanship and community mattered. My great-great-grandfather built our house himself back in 1872. Through the years, each generation has lovingly maintained both the home and connections with our neighbors. Sure, the occasional spat over an unruly pet or overgrown tree would arise, but nothing major. At least until recently. Out of nowhere, a group calling themselves the Historic Neighborhood Association started causing a ruckus. I began noticing strange rules popping up. No cars parked on streets, trash cans only permitted behind homes, exterior paint colors restricted. Then came the fees and penalties for violations. Apparently this group had appointed themselves rulers of our neighborhood overnight. When they first knocked on my door, I politely declined joining their association. My home belonged to my family, not some self-proclaimed overlords. They clearly didn't take rejection well, as fines soon appeared in my mailbox almost daily. $100 for failing to trim my hedges on their designated hedge trimming day. $250 for having my elderly dog in the front yard unattended. $500 for not replacing my antique front door with an approved model. It was absurd. I started asking around and found only about half our neighbors joined this preposterous association. Yet they still harassed all homeowners, even non-members like me. As the outrageous infractions and bills mounted, I decided to investigate who was behind this tyranny. The president of the association was Karen Smithson, the newcomer who just built a gaudy McMansion down the block last year. She oozed entitlement, believing that her money and status gave her authority over everyone. Her little loyal followers on the board consisted of old Mrs. Pembroke, the neighborhood gossip, and the Jensen brothers who resented anyone with an older home larger than their tiny lot. With some digging, I discovered the association didn't legally own any property at all. They were simply using intimidation tactics, not actual jurisdiction. At first I asked them to stop sending me baseless bills since I never consented to join, but Karen insisted I had no choice to comply with their rules and fees, vowing to seize my property if I didn't pay up. She said my family had already been benefiting from their improvements to the neighborhood, her smug tone and utter lack of reason prompted me to firmly tell her to get off my porch and never come back. Unfortunately, that only agitated Karen further. The very next day I arrived home to find a moving truck and several SUVs parked around my property. To my shock, Karen and her cronies were carrying boxes of my belongings into the truck. I immediately demanded to know what was happening. We're repossessing this home until all your unpaid fees are settled, Karen declared haughtily. I told them to get out of my house immediately, but Karen just held up some legal-looking document. This lien gives us full authority to seize your property as compensation for your debts, she claimed. Debts? I didn't owe them one cent. I informed them they were committing theft by taking my possessions and illegally trespassing in my family's home. Karen merely laughed snidely, apparently enjoying her power play. As her lackeys ransacked downstairs, I ran to my car and dialed cop to report the break-in and theft in progress. The operator assured me officers were on their way, yet Karen's parade of minions continued hauling out my furnishings undeterred, ignoring my protests. At long last, police cars pulled up with lights flashing. I hurried to explain what was happening to the officers. When questioned, Karen waved around her bogus lien but insisted they were fully entitled to seize my property. One officer examined the document, immediately noticing it bore no official court seal or judge's signature. This appears fraudulent. We need you all to step outside now, he told Karen sternly. How dare you, Karen shrieked. I'm the president of this association. We make the rules around here, not deadbeat losers like him. She pointed her bony finger at me in utter contempt. As Karen argued shrilly with the officers, I felt a small satisfaction seeing her pompous scheme unraveling. The police made the group return all my belongings and threatened to arrest them for trespassing if they set foot on my property again. One by one, they sullenly dragged everything back inside, under the watchful eyes of the cops. Karen still refused to relinquish her fake lean, clutching it tightly to her chest. Just you wait. This isn't over yet. She hissed at me as the officers escorted her away.
I knew it was wishful thinking that this incident would be the end of their harassment. So I immediately got to work bolstering my defenses. Security cameras were installed covering all angles of the house and yard. No trespassing signs went up on every possible entrance. I informed the police department that I feared further retaliation. I also reached out to the half of neighbors who, like me, refused to be intimidated into joining the association. Over the next week, we banded together to fight back. I wanted to make sure Karen and her little dictator board couldn't target me or anyone else ever again. With the help of a lawyer friend, I sent them an official cease and desist letter forbidding any further contact, false liens, fines, or trespassing. If they failed to comply, I would be pursuing both civil and criminal charges, including an official restraining order. My neighbors and I also circulated a petition to completely dismantle the fake association. Nearly everyone signed, having grown weary of the harassment and illegal strong-arm tactics. We presented our petition along with evidence of their abuses to our town council, demanding the association be outlawed and banned from our neighborhood altogether. After reviewing our documents and concerns, the council agreed the association held no legal rights and stripped them of any perceived authority. They were strictly prohibited from harassing homeowners, issuing bogus citations, trespassing, or enacting baseless rules ever again. Violators would face fines, eviction proceedings, and even jail time. We all breathed a sigh of relief knowing Karen and her minions finally lost their grip over the neighborhood. She made a few more empty threats to challenge the council's decision, but we paid her no heed. No way would we let that winding bag of hot air intimidate us any longer. These days our block is back to friendly waves and peaceful living. My 150-year-old home still stands proudly in the heart of our community, now unburdened by the menacing presence that tried to tear us apart. And I make a point to personally greet each new resident who moves here, just to ensure they know exactly who their neighbors are. The only association we need is our shared desire to protect the harmony of this historic neighborhood for generations yet to come. The next one is a pro-revenge story. Circa January 2020, my friend made a foolish decision and bought a brand new car he couldn't afford. His insurance cost him about $400 a month, and he earned only $10.25 an hour working as a shift supervisor at McDonald's. His car payment amounted to approximately $795 a month. With an hourly wage of $10.25 and working 30 hours a week, he earned roughly $300 a week, or about $1,230 a month. So, yeah. My friend turned to me for help because of my experience selling cars and my familiarity with the industry. I reviewed his paperwork. The dealer had indeed taken advantage of him, but my friend was determined to find a solution to his predicament. While the dealer had overcharged him for warranty, provided a higher APR and added extras, none of these actions were illegal. I knew the only way to help my friend was if the dealer had engaged in illegal activities. Examining the finance application my friend had signed, I noticed that his income was accurately listed. This sparked an idea in my mind. No bank would approve someone for a $795 car payment if they were only earning $1,200 a month. It simply didn't add up mathematically. I began scouring through his paperwork for the finance application the dealer had submitted to the bank. Often, when you submit a finance application at a dealership, they will electronically replicate the hand-filled application. This is quite common. However, on the application the dealer submitted to the bank, they had falsely stated that my friend was a general manager at McDonald's earning $70,000. Given my friend's good credit, it seemed the bank hadn't asked for proof of income. Accompanied by my friend, I went to the dealership and informed the sales manager that I needed to speak with the general manager because we were going to void my friend's deal and return his trade-in. The sales manager and the GM thought I was joking. I proceeded to demonstrate to the GM how his dealership's finance department had committed bank fraud. I presented the GM with the finance application my friend had filled out, and then I showed him the application his dealership had submitted to the bank, highlighting the income discrepancy. While my friend truly earned $14,000 a year, the dealership claimed he earned $70,000 a year. That constituted bank fraud, a felony. Let's keep this simple, shall we? The GM realized his dealership was in serious trouble. The evidence I presented was undeniable. 
He knew it. I knew it. We were all on the same page. He said, okay, so what can I do to make this right? I replied, void the deal and return my friend's trade in. Voiding the deal meant that the GM agreed to cancel the transaction, essentially erasing it from existence. The GM attempted to evade this, but I stood firm, reminding him that we could easily take this documentation and make his life a living hell. He knew I was right. Moreover, my friend needed a car to get to work the next day. The GM said he would look into it. When he returned, he informed me that unfortunately they had already sold my friend's trade-in. I responded, that's fine, void the deal and let's put my friend in something as good or slightly better than what he traded in for. The GM asked, so he'll buy a car similar to his trade-in. I corrected him saying, no, you'll give him a car similar to his trade-in. The GM argued, it doesn't work that way. I asserted, it does when you commit bank fraud. The GM was upset with me, but I reminded him that I was being quite accommodating, considering that the situation could escalate into felony-level charges or even lead to losing his franchise. So yes, this was going to sting, but it would sting less my way. Reluctantly, the GM agreed. He checked his inventory and informed me that they had a 2007 Focus with 10,000 more miles. I told him, no, the car you give my friend needs to be the same or better than what he traded in. The GM countered, I'm giving him a free car. I corrected him, stating, no, you took his trade in, sold it, profited from that sale, and committed a felony in the process of selling him his new car. Now you're rectifying that mistake. This isn't a free car for my friend. This is you correcting your mistake. The GM insisted that was all he could do. I warned him that if he couldn't do better, we would consult with a consumer protection attorney. Although my friend was hesitant to pursue this route, it served as our plan B. As we prepared to leave, the GM said, Wait, give me a second. Returning, he said, I have an 08 Civic with 5,000 more miles, but it's a Civic, not a Focus. I'll void the deal on the new car and put your friend in the Civic at no extra cost. We agreed. The GM had the paperwork drawn up. The loan for the new car was cancelled. They took back the new car, though they would have to sell it as used since it was already titled, which was unfortunate for them, and they provided my friend with a better car than the one he traded in. For those wondering why we didn't involve a lawyer from the start, we could have done that. However, courts take a long time, and this was a quicker way to resolve the situation. The next one is a petty revenge story. I live in one half of a duplex. The other half is occupied by the owner, my landlady. My landlady is awful. I won't go into detail so you'll just have to take my word for it. Since we live in close proximity I do everything within my power to keep the peace and prevent either of our daily lives from being too miserable. That patience finally wore out. My landlady decided to sell the entire duplex. Fine by me. I'm protected by my lease and I figure my odds are decent of getting a less crappy landlord out of the deal. Obviously, she needs to show the property to prospective buyers. My lease states she needs to give 24 hours notice before entering my half. I told her I'm even fine with less than that as long as she lets me know the night before. I also set her up with a personal code for my alarm so she can get in if I'm not home since I travel frequently. However, even this has been too difficult for her. Had a knock at the door last week. It's the landlady with a nice young couple. She asks if they can come take a quick look. I say no, sorry, I haven't had time to prepare for a showing since she gave me no notice. She pouts and says can they just take a quick peek from the doorway. I stay firm, tell them they can come back tomorrow if they like, and close the door. A few days later I'm heading out the door and bump into my landlady out on the street with a strange man. She says sorry for not calling yesterday but asks if they can go upstairs for a viewing. I say no. I have laundry out that I haven't put away and am not comfortable with a strange man looking at my underwear. She pouts. I'm in a rush and jump into my car. I arrive at work to a notification on my phone. It's my ring alarm system letting me know my landlady's code was used to deactivate and reactivate the alarm within the last few minutes. She's older and probably has no idea I can see who uses the alarm code. I'm seething. That night, I delete my landlady's alarm code from the system. I do not inform her of this. I figure if she needs to show the property while I'm out of town, I'll just deactivate the alarm remotely from my phone.
The next week I'm traveling for work. I spend the day in meetings. I check my phone to find a million notifications. Ring has let me know the alarm was tripped. My landlady has called a dozen times, left voicemails, sent angry messages. Yes, she tried to go into my apartment again without giving me a heads up. She was unable to deactivate the alarm. Let me tell you that alarm is loud. I assume half the neighborhood could hear it. I pay for ring monitoring so the police were also automatically called. Since she owns the property, it seems they didn't give her too much grief, but as the neighborhood Karen boy, is she pissed at being the center of drama? But hey, I bet she won't try to go into my apartment unannounced again. The next one is a malicious compliance story. About 14 years ago, I went to work for a major petroleum company in Indianapolis. Over my four years there, I applied myself and gained enough knowledge to be more knowledgeable than the most senior guy. Well... One day stuff hit the fan and we were looking at a potentially major spill because the packing in a pump had failed. Nobody was doing anything and I'm a take charge kind of guy, so I started barking orders. Now you have to understand this would have been an EPA nightmare so there was no time for niceties. The other employees went and complained and I was called into the manager's office and was told about the complaints that I just barked orders and didn't ask nicely. He told me that I did the right thing and that next time if it wasn't going to be a major issue to give them enough rope to hang themselves. Bet. So the next time I saw that they had the valves set up in such a way that two soap tanks, for making asphalt emulsion, would overflow, and while not an EPA big deal, it would bring scrutiny from the health, environmental, safety, and security decision of our company. I mentioned to them that they might want to check the valve lineup because something didn't look right. Well, they told me to mind my own business. As it was time for me to go home, I called the manager from my car and said you should probably start heading to the terminal, because two tanks are about to overrun. I tried to tell them, but they told me to mind my own business. I didn't get halfway home before a neighbor to the facility came knocking on the door saying liquid was overflowing two tanks. As the only first responder not involved in the incident, I had to return to the facility and supervise cleanup until the big guns from corporate came in about three hours later. All three were put on probation, and then eventually fired for more screw-ups. The beauty of this was after that incident, they were told to follow what I said explicitly, and never again complain that someone doesn't say please and thank you in a crisis. They all hated me until the day they left. Why? Because I was the only person to take charge when no one else would. The next one is an entitled people story. I'm referring to this post as if it were happening now, but actually it occurred a few years ago. The title sounds strange, but I really don't know how else to describe it. I was a 16-year-old from Serbia, and I live in the building next to my grandmother's, but our entrances don't face each other, so if I manage, I'll draw a map. Now, our buildings are divided into several units. Strange, but each entrance functions like its own building. As if we only share walls, you can't exit one entrance to get to another without leaving the building. Now, I live in the entrance facing another building. If I go around it, the other entrance leads to my grandmother's apartment. Unfortunately, my grandfather passed away eight years ago, leaving my grandmother alone in her apartment. My parents, back then, behind my back, saw one empty room and asked my grandmother if we could turn it into my private room because I needed privacy. My grandmother was thrilled with the idea. After discussing it with me, we made the room for me. Since I followed my grandmother's rules and helped her, I didn't spend all my time at her place. Instead, I switched between apartments as needed. For example, I'd come home from school, leave my things, and go to my grandmother's to sleep, then return home in the morning to have breakfast. I had a sort of routine for when I went where with an accuracy of plus or minus an hour. Now I live in the entrance facing another building. If I go around it, the other entrance leads to my grandmother's apartment. Directly in front of my entrance is another entrance, and above it on the window, 70% of the time when I went out, there was an elderly woman. She always looked at me somewhat grumpily as I passed by. Sometimes I glanced at her, but I had headphones on and often wore a hoodie, so I ignored her. When I had the second shift, I usually got home around 8.20, and then I went to my grandmother's around 10.30, of course, with exceptions. That woman was almost always there, but it didn't bother me because why would it? I saw her for 20 seconds a day. Once, when I was leaving my house to go to my grandmother's without headphones or a hoodie, she finally said something. Karen, you're going to get high again. Me. Huh? Karen. Every day, 
You go out with a hoodie over your head in the dead of night. It was 10.30 then. I can clearly see what you're doing. Me. What am I doing? Karen. Dealing drugs. What's in that backpack? Me. That's none of your business. Just a laptop and equipment. Karen. I think it's drugs. Open it and let me see. Me. I felt like telling her that the only thing I would open for her is a punch in the face. Leave me alone. And I just walked away. The next day, she was waiting for me outside the entrance. Karen. What's in that bag? Me. You're a psycho. Karen. If you don't tell me, I'll call the police. Me. Call whoever you want. I'm out of here. I left while she was yelling at me. The next day, two police officers were waiting for me outside the door with Karen. Karen. That's him. He's the local dealer. Me. What's going on? We'll refer to the police officers as P1 and P2. P1. We received a report that drug trafficking is happening here. Me. Looking at him. Is this for real? P2. As absurd as it may seem, we have to check it out. Me. Can you search me and let me go then? P1. We'll search you, but we won't let you go immediately because the lady said she saw you dealing. Me. That woman is crazy, but do what you have to do. I just want to get this over with. P1 searched me while Karen was yelling about me being a dealer. P2. How old are you? Me. 16. P2. Do you have an ID? Me. I literally went to the building next door. I don't even have a wallet. Can I go to my apartment to get it? I'll leave my backpack with the laptop as collateral that I'll return. P1. You live here? Me. Yes. P1. I'll accompany you to the apartment but won't enter. Me. Okay. When I returned to the apartment, my parents asked what I had forgotten. I said, can I get my wallet? My ID is inside. I want to buy a juice. By the way, I really wanted to buy juice for later. I returned to the police officer and my parents hadn't noticed anything yet. Not yet. We returned outside and I showed my ID, which was valid. P2. There's nothing in the backpack. The kid didn't cause any trouble and let's be real, just look at him. Karen, I know he has drugs, I saw him. Me, where? At this point, Karen made a mistake pointing to the place under the cameras. Me, when? Karen, she said the exact date. Me, great, we can check the cameras. Realizing her plan backfired, Karen did the only sensible thing. She slapped me. P1 handcuffed her and put her in the car while Karen was screaming. A small detail about me. I have a lot, a lot of pimples. I know one person who has approximately as many pimples as I do, and that's it. When you slapped me, it bled because I barely felt the slap, which made it look worse than it actually was. P1 went and informed my parents. They came out and my mom wiped away the blood while my dad talked to the police. He asked the officer if he could send me to wash up, and P1 sent me. Karen was convicted of assaulting a minor and misusing the police. Since we managed to hush up the whole story from the neighbors by some miracle, no one saw anything. Karen received a punishment and a stern warning. I was late for playing with my friends, which cost me a good heist and GTA. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.